Grant, we are so glad to have you tonight, and we're looking forward to it. It's going to be fabulous, I know. So I'll just turn it to you where we get maximum time. Okay, Bill. Thanks very much. All right. So the uh, the topic is lightning and grounding, and uh, of course, it's uh, complicated, but electrifying, uh, play on words. So why am I interested in this? Well, when I put up the big station here, the tower was going to go to 157 feet, which is well above the trees, and I'm living on a ridge although it's pretty flat up here for a bit. Uh, then we had uh, some interesting corona in the middle of a, of a contest, which uh, uh, is, was kind of wiped us out for a while. My career uh, in, uh, also includes uh, being living on the East Coast, where lightning is a much bigger problem, and um, sailing for many years. And I had one interesting experience tied to the dock at my home port. And uh, every time the lightning struck, well, between 500 and 1,000 feet away, the uh, AC outlets in the boat were arcing over. I was wondering what was going on. It turned out that the lead keel of the boat was the best ground for the town, which was kind of scary, so I quickly disconnected. Uh, I would not say I'm an expert on this topic. I've uh, uh, done a lot of reading and research, and I think it works, but you never know until the magic moment happens. And I would also say... Now, I talk a lot about it, but I, I need to do more work, just like almost anything in ham radio. There's always a way to make it better. So, uh, you know, big question here in the Pacific Northwest is why worry? Uh, to remember the old uh, the magazine cover. So we are in the lowest strikes per square kilometer in Washington, a little worse where you guys are in eastern Washington better here in Western Washington. So I guess the question is, you know, do you worry about it? Two strikes per square kilometer doesn't sound like a lot, but that's still significant. You might be lucky, you might have insurance, but uh, it still could be pretty exciting. And of course, you know, one thing we noticed here in the Redmond QTH is more lightning than folks who you know, lived here much longer than I have and moved here in 2010 said, wow, that's, you know, that's, it's picked up. And uh, maybe that's global warming, climate change, I don't know. But there were several Western Washington's uh, hands that did get hit in, in those storms back then. So it does happen. So being prepared is the best insurance. So uh, understanding lightning is really an important thing and, and uh, how it works. And it's you know, best to talk about it as an RF event. It's Rise times are so fast and its uh, currents are so high, it generates a lot of uh, RF and coupling. And uh, so we're going to talk about its characteristics and what happens. How do you reduce the impact of strikes? Well, if you're going to get hit directly, good luck. I mean, it's it's uh, it does what it wants to do. It goes where it wants to go. And you can have some defense, but it may it's probably not going to work if you're hit directly. But you can do a lot for the nearby strikes, and we'll talk a lot about that. The other thing is, what is ground? And, uh, you know, how do you connect to it? And what does that mean? We talk about power grounds. That's one kind of ground. We talk about RF grounds, which really kind of don't exist. And we talk about grounding and bonding for lightning. So we're going to talk really about that third topic. And the most important thing to remember in thinking about how the station and the wiring and the tower and the ground system works is we're talking mainly about inductance being the controlling variable, not the, the basic DC resistance of the system. So what is lightning? Well, RF event, very fast rise times, a few microseconds. Uh, the, strike, the strikes themselves, the current is lasts for tens of microseconds and it's somewhere between 10,000, almost a million amps. The interesting thing is it's most strikes are bi-directional. Uh, we get a, a, a cloud to ground strike, meters down, streamers up, but then we might get a reverse polarity strike the other way because it kind of overdoes it in terms of redistributing the charge. Uh, we think about towers as pretty uh, fat, <laughs> solid, low resistance conductors, but even a 75 foot mast has 20 microhenries of inductance uh, over its length. So. That's really a controlling variable. Of course, when the stri a strike hits the tower, you've got hundreds of thousands of volts at the top and, uh, and to the bottom uh, where the ground system is. And the question is, how do you 
minimize the the uh, the voltage differentials and potential that gets coming from the tower towards the shack. You know, one of the things that's done, uh, for example, is to bond the coax at the top and bottom. Most folks know know that and do that. But even in the commercial industries, I've read, you know, people will actually bond the coax for tall towers multiple spots along the tower uh, in order to try and minimize any differential voltage between the coax running down the tower and, and the tower itself. Uh, around the base of the tower, we get thousands of volts just because of the little residual inductance and the inductance of the ground field. So there's a lot of volts here, uh, and we want them to go in the direction which causes the least damage. That's really, uh, really uh, uh, something that we're trying to do here. Uh, there's a lot of a lot written about lightning, and some of it's uh, you know, the Motorola book is the Bible. I think it's 400 pages or more of detailed information. Uh, there are uh, lots of standards for commercial operations. This is uh, Times Protect has a very simple 20-page little pamphlet, which I found the, the most easy to understand as to what's going on. That you know clarified a lot of more obscure and, and complex topics. But here's what happens in a strike. 360,000 volts are an example strike. Not everyone will look like this at the uh, top of the tower, hopefully pretty close to uh, ground potential at the bottom of the tower, but that's really not quite the case. And if we just go a few feet up the tower where the cables are going to come out, we got 28,000 volts. So that that tower connection of the coax right there where it's bonded to the tower is bringing 28,000 volts into your shack. Not great, and we need to do a lot to protect ourselves from that. So that's kind of a, you know one of the, I think, more illuminating examples of uh, what really is going on because it's an RF event. We got inductance in the tower. Uh, we have inductance in the wires. We have inductance in the ground field. And everything is going to move around as a result of that very high voltage and currents being applied. So, uh, you know, that's the that's the worst case example. Uh, you have a direct strike, but probably most damage to amateur radio stations occurs by nearby strikes. You know, we never want to be in that ex that situation where it's hair raising, where we're we're feeling that we are, you know, part of the target. Now, our antennas are big capacitors and can be you know, big uh, loops and inductors, uh, and uh, we are also. And how that charge flows from the strike to and from the surroundings is what we see. I mean, there's a classic picture I've seen on the web where the a tree's being hit, and you see the lightning coming down the tree, and then it spreads out over the roots across the ground, which is kind of frequently happens, which is the, the current is trying to find a way out to a lower potential, and you've got uh, that that high voltage differential right at the surface of the ground. That creates a kill zone where those voltage differentials uh, can do electronics. And I was surprised to read that you know standing 50 feet from a strike, the voltage potential you know is maybe significant across your one foot to the other that it'll get you. And there's information that, uh, for example, a lot of cattle cows die near lightning strikes because their footprint is so large and up one leg and down the other and zap, uh, not good. So the other things that happen, you've got a, you know, any capacitor around antennas, you 300,000 volts in a few microseconds uh, uh, brings a, a lot of charge to bear. And I mentioned earlier, the lower voltage rebound can be a problem where lightning actually strikes multiple times in one event, it doesn't strike once. So the conductive surges on all the other things that are in your shack, ethernet, power lines, uh, phone, cable TV, you name it, are all places where voltage differentials can, can appear and be significant enough to cause uh, damage to the electronics. The other thing is you put up loop antennas, you know, you've, now you've got a wonderful magnetic structure that can uh, is, uh, induced current uh, and voltages can be quite significant. So something to be think about when you what what antennas you put up depending on where you live. And uh, then cables that are parallel to the strike, 
or to the grounding wires can also be a source of uh, voltage being induced that will cause problems later. So what are the goals uh, that we're trying to accomplish with minimizing potential damage? So you want to get as much current into the ground at the tower or the antenna as we can. We want to minimize the voltage that is applied to the, the wires that go out there, the cables, the coax, control lines, your stepper, motor drivers, et cetera. And uh, we'd like to keep them all the same. That's another factor we'd like to do. So the differential voltage between those uh, cables is minimized. It may all go, we want all to bounce at one time at the same place, at the same voltage. So we need a good ground rod field to try and suck that current and distribute it into the ground so it could do less damage. And we can use that uh, ground rods or use a UFER uh, concrete uh, with embedded uh, rebar, which I have in a couple situations. And uh, so we want the voltage bounce, as I mentioned, to be the same. You know, the, the, the literature talks a lot about single point ground, and that's a great thing if you can do that, where everything in your shack is grounded at one spot, and that spot is also the place where you are bonded to a very good uh, ground rod field. When I look at my station and my house, the separate well system, separate tower, separate generator, separate shack. I mean, there's wires running everywhere and power and control cables and ethernet, you know, thinking about a single point ground and that just doesn't make any sense. How do you deal with that? Well, I think you deal with that by building a ground mesh with the best grounding you can produce at every spot where you've got uh, an entry or a, you know, co uh, say Comcast cable coming in or the plain old telephone system line coming in or whatever it might be. And infrequently, those are very haphazard grounds that you'll find that what the cable company did or what the phone company did. And even when you think about the safety ground from your uh, residential power supplier, you know, that's a, those are mostly useless for uh, what we're trying to do in terms of lightning protection. The other trick, which uh, is now more feasible, is you start doing uh, RF links or optical links as much as you can. And boy, that really kind of disconnects systems so that whatever voltage is induced out there on the tower or in the house isn't going back and forth between the various uh, the various ends of the wires because uh, there are no wires. So, you know, even a simple 10 foot long optical ethernet may really make a difference. And it's not that expensive anymore to do that. And it completely isolates you now. If it's plugged into the back of your radio, it isolates your radio completely from the rest of the ethernet running around in your home or in your shack, something to think about. So in terms of managing this incredible amount of energy, we have to deal with it in a layered uh, concept. You can't, you can't put an MOV at the base of the tower and expect that that's gonna do anything except vaporize. So we have to use uh, a, a layered system. And the most important thing in that layered system is that we've got no penetrations of things around each layer of protection. So, you know, if you've got a telephone line coming in and it's not grounded at the entry and it's not protected in those layers, then it can be the main source of the major strike energy coming right into your shack. A friend of mine had a camp up in the Adirondacks and that's exactly what happened. Lightning came in through the telephone line, blew all the telephones in the building including them blowing it right off the wall, <laughs> a big hole in the wall. Uh, so, you know, you've got to, you've got to go at it in terms of uh, each layer doing most of it can in terms of uh, getting rid of the energy. <clears throat> so out at the tower, the, uh, you know, the situation is to get the, uh, get drain out as much energy as you can, whether it be tower or where the uh, actual coax comes in if you're using wire antennas. So ground rods, the UFERS, um, to explain that, is uh, using the concrete uh, as a great 
large area conductor and distribute the energy through the concrete via the rebar and tying that rebar to uh, the tower base or to the ground ground spot, the single point ground with uh, the heavy, heavy bonding wires. Uh, that works well. In fact, it's worked so well that it's mandated more in residential construction in high lightning areas. And it's a requirement for things like uh, ammunition bunkers, um, fuel storage and things like that. And then spark gaps, you know, the old traditional spark gap can suck a lot of energy out and chokes. And in many places, slow down the rise time, uh, give, you know, spread out the energy a bit, give the other means of protection a chance to work. So we do that at the tower at the, or the antenna entry point. And then we have an entry panel. It might be the same case in, in wire antenna situations where <clears throat> we're going to use a, a, a perhaps faster, more sophisticated kind of uh, protection like gas discharge tubes. Uh, you can buy those. Uh, there's other, other variations of uh, choke-based grounding uh, widgets that you can buy that you mount to a, a bonding panel and um, they, they suck some of the energy out. Chokes again, uh, the building, a building Uford, uh, entry point ground rod field, and another one to consider seriously is a whole house uh, building surge protector that, that protects uh, the station from stuff coming in via over the power line as opposed to differential voltages between power line and ground. At the electronic level, we're now need, de dealing with maybe hundreds to thousands of volts or thousand volts, and we're dealing with the much smaller currents if the other levels are doing their job. So the uh, transient voltage suppression diodes, which are the back-to-back -back zeners, and the station ground plane plate or ground heavy grounding bus for everything in your station will, I think, help uh, minimize all that differential voltage, uh, both line to ground and 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 all the lines to uh, each other. So. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of things now are doing this uh, from the factory. I guess Stepper used to have that as an extra option that you can buy. I think it's now built into some of the newer controllers. So those the zone protection is quite important in terms of you know managing the energy and getting rid of it at the right time, right point. So tower and feed line. I mentioned this bonding top and bottom. Uh, a lot of folks don't put a ground wire around from the mass to the around the rotator, either the tower to the mast above the rotator or rotator around the mast and ast. But, it, you know, that helps a lot. It protects the rotator from, uh, uh, and the rotator, rotator bearings, even from a static that's picked up from the wind. So you look in some rotators and you can see, I've rebuilt a few, and you can look and see the actual pitting in the ball bearings where there have been discharges not a lightning strike, but just you know the normal static buildup. So that's worth some, that's worth doing for many reasons. You know, dirt is a good attenuator, and uh, it's lossy uh, and it's a partial conductor. So if you can get things buried, that really helps a lot. Um, you know, kind of a worst case example. One of the, one of the fellows here uh, got a a loop, a, a antenna hung at, for eighty meters. And a, and a horizontal 25 feet off the ground uh, coax to feed it. And I think, wow, boy, there's an exciting design to maximize the, uh, the, uh, what could happen in a, in a nearby or even a, a you know, direct lightning strike. So third is your friend. Uh, spark gaps, one way to go. Non-inductive carbon comp resistors are another way to go to keep the uh, low static charges uh, or even a nearby strike voltages from uh, getting into the center conductor of the coax. That helps a bit. And chokes, as I mentioned before. And of course, I'm a really big fan of these uh, clip-on chokes or the K9YC choke designs. You know, I really think um, an awful lot of what we experience as RFI is really stuff that we're producing in the house or in the shack and putting out on the coax, which runs up to the antenna, and then is radiated or, or, or is conducted right back into the uh, receiver. And uh, you know, even with a very good set of antennas and a kilowatt plus, um, 
I'm often in a situation where, you know, having put probably hundreds of chokes on coaxes and cables everywhere, I hear better than I can talk. And that kind of surprises me sometimes. That really is a testament to it's the RFI at the other end or the QRM at the other end, which is really limiting uh, or sometimes our ability to talk to somebody, especially in Europe, as we all know. And surge protectors, I mentioned this, but this is something you can do both at the tower and at the entry panel. Uh, probably at the entry panel is a little more conservative way to do it, where you've got already some protection at the tower. So here's a couple shots from my station. So this is the base of uh, five, uh, uh, 589, H US Tower HDX 589 crank up. And when I build it, I, it's got uh, six feet by six feet by nine feet. So I think that's about 170 Maybe it's more square feet of concrete in, in contact with the earth. And there's a wire somewhere that you can't quite see that, or I guess the, uh, the tower itself is, is bolted to the, the uh, conductor that is connected to the, um, to the, uh, the, the rebar inside. So 100 square feet is, is a lot compared to a, Three quarter inch ground rod, ten feet long. I mean, that's uh, that's only I think one point five square feet. So you really get a lot of benefit from using uh, concrete in contact with ground to uh, to provide a very low uh, impedance and very low resistance uh, path to ground. Um, so here's some other station shots. This is the hundred forty two foot tower with a twenty feet of mast, actually seventeen feet of mast sticking out and uh, 80 meter beam right at the top. And then it's got a 40 meter beam, three elements full size, and then a five over five on 2015 and 10. So a lot of aluminum, you know, rotating rings for each antenna, uh, prop pitch for the top 80 meter beam. So this is what caused me to really get deeply, more deeply in this in terms of worrying about what might happen. And there's also two 589s here. There's a, a four element stepper just barely see in the corner here. And then there's another uh, 589, which uh, has a DB36 on it, plus um, some VHF stuff. So this is the base of the uh, Rhone 65. And, and each leg is connected to, at this time, I was using number six wires. And now code says you should use the number two wire. There's some good reason for doing that. And I can talk about later. But this, this is 40 square feet of concrete sitting on gravel for the, the, per, the professional engineer's design. So there's really not a UFER, you know, it's not in contact with earth that might have some moisture in it. Uh, uh, so it's pretty much insulated by sitting on gravel, uh, and which is a terrible, you know, if you think about <laughs> trying to ground on a, a rocky surface, it's, it's virtually impossible without drilling big holes in the rocks. I mean, really big holes, really deep holes. I hiked in, in Maine and went to a what's called Bald Mountain, which is literally a bald mountain. There are no trees. It's all granite on top. And there was a radio repeater there of some sort, solar powered. And what they'd done is strung big cables like uh, three-eighths or half-inch standard seal cables, kind of as an umbrella over the top of that mountain in order to provide some sort of ability to di distribute the charge and conducting it away. So pretty interesting. The um, entry panel here, down here in this um, uh, little shack I built for the cable coming in and then running uh, in conduits back to the shack uh, is all uh, uh, standard Heliax commercial grounding uh, this is it's, uh, LDF-5 for 10, 15, and 20, and LDF-4 for 40 and 80. So this is the standard wraparound uh, conductor on the conductor of the Heliax, and then coming to a common bonding panel. And then there's two wires that run down to the uh, ground rod field. So that's kind of the tower bonding plate. In terms of the 589s, the uh, uh, is done in a, uh, fiberglass enclosure, and we've got the uh, the gas discharge type of lightning arresters here on the coax. We've got a, uh, a stepper 
uh, lightning protection box here. And uh, so each one's protected. <clears throat> and underneath this where the coax comes out uh, and uh, goes towards the conduits back to the shack, there are clamp-on ferrites on every wire. There's no such thing as too large an enclosure. <laughs> One of my favorite things there, you know, <laughs> it's so true. No matter what you, how big you get, it ain't big enough. <laughs> so electronic transient protection devices. Well, you know, we're in the innermost zone. MOVs uh, work. Uh, big downsize because they don't, they, they, they degrade rather than just blowing up. And that can cause RFI in its own right because they're nonlinear. The Allen K6RFK had a plastic outlet strip with MOVs. He had uh, a, apparently a nearby strike. The MOVs went into conduction. They caught on fire. They uh, caught on the plastic on fire, caught his shack on fire, burned up a lot of con Collins vintage gear. A very sad situation. So if you have MOVs, put them in, make sure they're in metal containers or just clip them out and move to a whole house monitored MOV device. Intermatic makes these. This is one I've got in my shack. It's got circuit breakers. It's got replaceable, very high capacity MOVs. And it's got green LEDs and red LEDs to tell you whether they're working or they're broken. So you can actually, if one blows up, you can pull it out and replace it. And if they go short blow up, it'll trip the breaker. So you're well protected. Uh, TBS diodes, uh, I like those. They, they're, they're cheap. They're, they absorb a hell of a lot of energy. And they're very fast. And either they're there or they're, they're vaporized. So, uh, and you can get them in every combination of, uh, of voltages and capacities. So, you know, from, I think, 12 volts up to 200 or more. So most any signal can be bypassed. You know, can't really bypass RF with them, but most any signal can be protected with uh, this type of device. Very low capacitance, too. Uh, another way to go is line filters. Um, you know, the, the traditional line filters, but one hazard with line filters that are made to current codes is uh, UL will not allow anything to be put on the green wire. So, you know, one thing I've learned in trying to suppress RFI out of field bay generators is you got to get a choke on that green wire. And that's also true for lightning protection. So you need, you need to isolate the green inductively, uh, which for 60 hertz doesn't matter. I mean, it's still perfectly good safety lead, but, but uh, for an RF event, a choke will help isolate that uh, and filter the, 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 the garbage that can come in over the green wire. The other thing to do is uh, shielded isolation transformers, which uh, there is be a you know shield between the uh, two windings so that capacitive coupling can occur between primary and secondary winding. And so that's another little trick to uh, help out. And that is actually what they've got on my ring rotators, the power for them goes through a shielded isolation transformer to help out. What else helps? Well, I mentioned inductance, it chokes everywhere. Uh, there's an interesting thing that I saw that broadcast band transmitters will put a giant ferrite choke on the feed line so that it gives a little time for the emergency disconnect relays on the, on the final amplifier time to operate. An interesting thing that even uh, even they're doing. Improved grounds, I mentioned that, serious transit protection, transient protection. And the other thing maybe to consider if you can do it in your shack is everything's on the same line one or line two leg of your 240 volt split uh, entry system. So you've got line one, neutral line two, then you've got safety ground green. So if you always stay on line one to neutral or line two to neutral, very simple thing just to you know wire up to that outlet then uh, you've got less less potential for bad potential happening between various parts of your station i mentioned optical links and rf links i use green hair and everywhere which provides a little bit of isolation it's not all the way to the tower but it is between the computer and some of the components in the shack. So that that helps. Um, some, I'm a fan of that. I think it really is a pretty neat product. Grant, and this also Grant, is, yes, go ahead. 
Could you tell more about that uh, green heron? I've wondered more about that, and I, I've never seen it, so I'd be interested to hear more about it. Yeah, well, uh, you know, green heron everywhere, our T21s, you know, they're, they're kind of the standard for rotator controllers. Uh, they make a uh, RF link. It operates in the 2.5 gigahertz, 801.2, but it is a, a uh, industrial protocol. So it's, it's, you know, fully acknowledged messages. And it controls, for example, my antenna switch, uh, which is a 4 by 12 antenna switch. It, it, there's a whole variety of widgets he makes. You connect one transmitter and it can control multiple widgets and uh, yeah, relay contacts, uh, remote uh, rotator drivers. Um, you, they're all programmable, set up a big spreadsheet. It allow you to select antennas by frequency, by band segment. Uh, I have a tunable 80 meter dipole. It selects band segments, uh, 10 band segments, depending as I just turned the VFO, it automatically selects the next step in the tuning of that antenna. A little difficult to set up. It's a little mind bending because it's different than anything I've ever seen before. Uh, but Jeff at Green Heron, who is, is Green Heron, Mr. Green Heron, is a very helpful guy. He loves to talk to customers and uh, provides a, a terrific support. So it's worth something taking a look at if, uh, if, it, if, it, if your station gets into multiple antennas or multiple uh, segment antennas, it's a pretty neat product. I could, I'd be glad to demo that. Anybody wants to see it at some point too. And all my rotators, all the antenna switching, all the antenna uh, um, azimuth control is all done by Green Heron everywhere. Okay, so, and now what is a good ground? Well, I mentioned earlier that, you know, your AC mains safety ground, which is there in case something goes wrong in the power system and it, you don't want your power system floating off or having large differential voltages between line one and neutral, line two and neutral. One ground rod, 60 ohms is kind of the traditional or standard in, you know, medium conductivity earth, that one ground rod is going to be 60 ohms. Well, you think about putting some current into 60 ohms, it's not going to do much. Um, and lightning ground, as much as I said, inductance is what counts. Now, tower grounds, you know, for amateur radio, we use a proxy using a resistance now for measuring how good lightning ground is, the lightning ground rod field. And um, there's some ways of measuring that pretty accurately. Uh, I'll talk about that. So amateur stations are typically trying to shoot for better than 10 ohms. Commercial, I think generally it's required that they get less than five ohms. So uh, that's a, that means a much larger ground field. Uh, KY9C. As a nice same statement uh, about RF grounds, ground is not a sink you can pour RF into. That's really true. You know, it's it's uh, it's a conductor, another conductor. Now, one of the guys I worked for had a favorite saying: "Is there's no such thing as ground. Everything's got inductance. Everything's got resistance. It's only a matter of the point where somewhere in a big computer system you just say, well, that's ground right there. You know, that point is ground. <laughs> and where is it commercially? Well, we don't know." Of course, you know, it's also important to remember that, you know, there's a pretty large different difference in conductivity between what we call average growth, uh, earth, Siemens per meter 0 0.005, and salt water is four, but copper is 60 million. So, you know, when I see people trying to use salt water as a ground, an actual ground for antennas, I say, well, you know, maybe you want to think about copper instead because there's a little difference between the conductivity of salt water and copper, although salt water makes a good RF creator of far field antenna patterns. Totally awesome. So inductance is what matters. You know, the old formula, voltage equals the inductance times the rate of change of current divided by the rate of change of volt of uh, I mean, the rate of change of current or DI over DT. So <clears throat> you can see that we got big numbers on DI and small numbers on DT. And of course, using inductors in parallel reduces the overall inductance. So that's what we're doing with a ground rod field. They should be separated by ground rods typically by two or three times their length. And uh, that kind of gets you to 10 foot rods, gets you maybe to 60 feet of 
wire is where you kind of run out of utility as the inductance keeps going up. So 10 rods in a, in a field, <clears throat> two or three rods per wire, and 60 foot long wires, that's probably, you know, pretty, that's a pretty good ground system. Let me say it that way, uh, if you can do that. And of course, everything's connected to a bonding panel at the tower base. And then if you can repeat that at the entry panel, uh, that's great. And some people say, well, I use a copper panel, but no need. Aluminum is just as good and saves you a heck of a lot of money. <clears throat> Eight and 10 foot ground rods and the UFERS, another one. I mentioned this earlier, footings, uninsulated slabs of houses that have ground, uh, have rebar in them, tower bases, huge earth contact, uh, mandated for hazardous operations and more frequently than residential buildings. I have a um, underground high voltage to the house from the, from the overhead power distribution and the high voltage transformer that makes the 120 and 240 volt is, is buried and it's basically a UFER. Um, they've got ground lugs coming out of the side of the concrete. Now there's a new code which is rather confusing because it says you can't run UFER bonding wires through the concrete. That That's not the wire that's connected to the tower, that's the wire that connects to other ground rods. And so, it, you know, we don't need to worry about it too much. I think the standard now for ground rod wire connecting is now to dig in the trench 24 inches deep, although I'm not sure of that. Somebody here may know better than I do. Uh, and if you've got very poor grounds, then people in, in broadcast world and so on will drill 30, 40, 60 feet deep and put uh, pipes in or uh, conductively cased electrodes and uh, to get a better ground. Of course, if you got a, a vertical antenna with radials, uh, if they're bare wires, you, you've made a pretty good ground, uh, ground field. Here's what my station looks like. Um, uh, kind of where I could put grounding rods. Um, I have a well that's 460 feet deep, so that's pretty good ground. Um, and I measured this um, with a, uh, I'll show you, I don't have a picture of it, but I'll talk about it. Uh, in dry conditions, this is an almost eight ohm ground rod field. In wet conditions, it's uh, like now, or maybe a little later from now, it'll be five ohms. Uh, a surprising thing, because my wires are not 24 inches deep, they're only about six inches deep. Um, hmm. It went up and it had very, very heavy frost here. So that's that really kind of fascinated me. You know, water is not a very con good conductor when it's frozen. All right, um, installing ground count ground rods. You know, you can use the old sledgehammer standing on the ladder and have somebody help, help you. That's kind of ugly. Um, slide hammers, well, it works, but pretty hard sometimes given the hard pan we have around here. Uh, a hammer drill, you can rent one with a ground rod driver. Man, that is the way to go. You can drive those ground rods in with minimum grief. And then the co connecting ground rods to ground the ground wires, um, the, the way to go is pyrotechnics, the, the uh, copper thermite CAD weld by Airco, and you get that at Platt or other electrical supply places. KF7P uh, sells the harder uni shots, and boy, you get a lot of fun with this too, and there's fireworks in your background, backyard and many wire and size combinations. Um, and once you do that, they are welded together. They are not going to come apart. They're not going to deteriorate being buried. Uh, it's 100% forever. If you use the mechanical clamps, which we frequently see on the sa power safety grounds, uh, you got to leave those above ground because the code says you need to inspect those regularly, make sure they work, and they're not very good. So the old NEC code was six gauge wire for grounding. The newest two gauge solid tin. Very interesting thing about that. 30 feet of that buried is equal to one 10 foot three quarter inch ground rod. So you kind of get double duty uh, out of a bigger conductor. You get uh, free ground rods, if you will. Not really free because the wires are expensive. And I said, I mentioned you got to supposed to bear it now 24 inches, which is you know, I think for ham operation, I wouldn't bother with trying to do it 24 inches, you know, but more than six. So how do you figure out what the ground rod, how the ground field resistance is? Well, you can't hook up an ohm meter. You get all this freight, you know, uh, you got galvanic DC potentials, you've got 60 hertz everywhere. 
but there's this wonderful little meter, uh, ground rod, ground field or ground rod measuring meter. It's a clamp on meter. It, it excites AC, not a, a, a harmonic of 50 or 60, and it measures directly the resistance. And you can make a small loop of wire, uh, put this on it, and it'll say zero ohms. Um, that's how you actually calibrate it. There are other ways of trying to measure and, and then kind of guessing what it is, but this is a very direct way of measuring resistance at, at that low AC frequency. There are other ways, you know, if you want to measure RF properties, then that's another, another whole ball game in terms of uh, other technologies. Um, so it's a very cool product. Um, so you put a ground rod in. Now what's the other, where does the other lead go? Well, the way you do this is you put a second rod in and assume that the resistance is equal for both rods. It won't be, but you make that assumption. And as you drive more and more rods, you keep doing the same thing again and again, measuring the new rod against all the old rods that are already in parallel. And so eventually you get down to the point where they're averaging out to a low value and you can measure specifically what the new rod is. And there's a little error, error, error component in that, but it usually doesn't matter. And of course, one of the tricks here is not to get into a measuring a loop because once you measure a little loop and if you go back and look at my my installation there's actually a loop and if i put the the ground the ground ohm meter on that it measures zero ohms of course um and you or you can measure against a known good rod uh known good ground rather sorry a big ufer is a one shot and maybe what pse calls not the ground rod but the new the safety wire coming into your house the green if you will at your panel might be a good ground, but you really never know about what that is. So remember that low resistance is the proxy, it's inductance that matters. So here's, here's all my measurements of each individual ground rod and you parallel them all up and you get uh, those numbers I gave you earlier. And I, the shop, the, the shop shack, you for 630 square feet of concrete, so that's probably very low. Uh, but a, just remember that a sing, single ground rod is about 60 ohms. So alternate strategies. Well, hmm, what are the alternate strategies here? Anybody have any? <laughs> Buy insurance? <laughs> <laughs> have a rabbit's foot? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, how about fables? Well, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's sold on eBay or Amazon or on the web that says this is going to help you reduce strikes. Well, I think the literature kind of says, nah, not really. Um, it's it's bonding and ground rods that do the work. And uh, there are, you know, lightning rods, which in, in buildings do help guide the current to the right place. But unless you've got that bonding and you've got the ground field, they don't do anything. And there's really no way to locally reduce the voltage that is happening by nature between the clouds and the ground or the wind, the wind and the ground. And remember, there are, is the situation of blue sky lightning, which is really, you know, it, it happens. And, you know, people are killed by standing out in the field and, you know, the beautiful clear blue sky and they get hit. And so it happens. Uh, precipitation static, you know, that's something I mentioned earlier, which you want to protect yourself from. And, and it's not, it's not static on drops. It's really Corona. And as I mentioned, you know, it used to be called St. Elmo's fire in the old days with sailing ships and the top of the mast would all turn blue and sparkly. And that's, you know, it's all, you know, the voltage gradient is so great that it's giving Corona. And this happened on my 80 meter antenna completely wiped out hearing anything on 80 meters. You couldn't see it because it was snowing like crazy, but it, it was there and every antenna below that was perfectly fine. So it's, it is a, a, a voltage gradient and, and Corona problem. And WHAI goes into on his website uh, a lot about this. You know, there's this theory of the arc of protection, a cone of protection, and it is true, it works, it helps. But in the end, you know, it's kind of statistical. It's not a sure thing. And another one, which is commonly seen on you know, the various web, websites is, oh, if you put a conductor in concrete, it's going to blow up. Well, you know, if you think about uh, rebar, you get a lot of it 
in a in a base. It distributes the current a lot, very broadly. It's very brief. It's a lot of energy, but it doesn't stay there. It's gone. So you know you can't get to the heating level that that required to uh, crack concrete. So it's it's very very rare that this happens. I think it does happen now and then in the high voltage power distribution, you know, in the grid, but that is still even there. It's like, there's only a few instances recorded of it happening. Um, I sent Mel a copy of the presentation. He's going to put it up, I think, on your website. So here's some of the material that I've looked at if you want to learn more. <laughs>